Hello, my friends, and welcome to the first official episode of the Modern Publishers Podcast. The uh, episode zero, if you're interested in the official technical or the unofficial technical trial run for the podcast, that was published on our new YouTube channel, which is called the Assembly of Modern Publishers. And the point of the YouTube channel is different in some ways from the uh, some of the YouTube channels that I have that are more oriented on communicating a personal vlog, talking about my personal efforts in ministry pertaining to myself and my excuse me, my family. And this YouTube channel, however, I hope to be heavily involving other individuals in the form of other content creators who I, I hope to uh, begin to partner with. And in addition to some other, uh, other things. Welcome, uh, howdy, Brandon. It's nice to see you here. Uh, I wanted to actually address something that's very important and uh, often, and I, I, you've mentioned this before, that some people use the seem to use the term or give the impression with the term modern publishing as if older forms of publishing are inferior, inadequate, ought to be cast aside. And I simply do not agree with that philosophy, that idea. It is absolutely important that we continue in every avenue of evangelistic effort and publishing effort that we, that does exist. And uh, I am Fully, fully an advocate for the written word, the handwritten word, the spoken word in public, the printed word, the um, handwritten letter, all of these things are forms of publishing, and I would include them and not exclude them from the overall large umbrella of modern publishing. I like to say that in every era, Modern publishing has been inclusive of every avenue, every method of publishing that is available to the human person in that uh, season of history. Uh, so one of the things I hope to do today is give a brief vision casting of what the modern publishing uh, podcast is, what the assembly of modern publishers is, and especially communicate to people that the goal is to podcast on the modern publish the assembly of modern publishers YouTube channel. And in order to do that, the requirements of YouTube are to have 50 subscribers, I believe. And we currently only have uh, 11 or so, I think, maybe a little, maybe a few more. However, um, if you are available to subscribe, you can just, uh, we would really appreciate if you could do that because I pray we can get to 50 so that we can not um, bog down the, the uh, notification box, um, boxes or whatever of the individuals who are interested in exclusively open the armory content because open the armory will continue to do short form and long form and even what I call content micro content and nano content content being content of any length full length content sermons larger longer talks and interviews and then content being or micro content being clips from larger content or content that's deliberately made to be a few minutes long to 15, 20 minutes long, maybe. And then the new era of the mic, the nano attention span of the modern viewer or just the efficiency of the modern content creator. You can argue, you can just have a different perspective either way. 
but either one you find uh, some some interesting things um, uh, anyway the content will be continue to be created by faith if the Lord will on the open the armory channel however we hope to continue to have this podcast and especially have podcasts where we sit down and interview someone um someday perhaps i can interview you brother brandon if you're watching still um because you are really have been an inspiration to me in regard to your content creation um because you have been a modern publisher you've made um like even just the notes that you've published um <laughs> thank you brother um the notes that you publish for your sermons and you you have a very active um successful youtube channel um which you're welcome to link in the chat people can check that out oh um so for those of you who want to subscribe to the channel i'll put a link in the um description or the comments on the youtube and i will uh link it here as well. So, um, the, the, yeah. So here we have it. We're at 17 subscribers. There's the, uh, the link there on Facebook. For those of you on Facebook, we are streaming on, um, uh, we are streaming on YouTube, as far as I know. Let me check to make sure everything's going well. Uh, this is a new realm for me. Uh, I appreciate your prayers and uh, encouragement. Yeah, so we're still, we're doing well. I think we're doing well on, on YouTube here. We got some, okay, there we have it. Um, yeah, so here we go. Um, ever since things worth saying have been able to be said, people have been publishing the truth or publishing something. And if you look at this, there's an infographic here. Um, I can link it in the description. Um, but if you disregard the... Um, this conception that this whoever put this together has in regard to the like ancient the very very ancient age of the earth um i think this is a very valuable tool um it starts with saying that the earliest one of the earliest known form of publishing and record keeping was in fact uh cave paintings and um they, uh, one of the earliest ones that was ever found was a, uh, a, a cave painting in Spain, apparently. Uh, the, this chart uh, attributes around 3000 BC to be the um, early existences of clay tablets. If you bear in mind that given the biblical record, there was not much need for a physical record given that there was the physical record of the memory of the humans who were like like Adam was alive would have been alive around like a little before 3000 BC I believe or maybe still alive so because he lived to be over 900 years old so the, the original publishing record, the original record was the record in the brain of the humans that existed and had like really advanced minds and really health and really, um, anyway, it's a whole different time. So as soon as people started dying, which, um, you know, Cain, I believe, uh, you know, killed Abel, so that was one of the early deaths. But when people started dying of old age, as people say, that's when people were like, hey, maybe we should write this down. So we do get, um, so write this down so that future generations can have the wisdom of the, the previous. So 
you notice in in 3000 BC you have clay tablets, papyrus rolls, clay stamps were used to seal important documents. So there's a few things going on in the publishing front. By the second century, we jump all the way to the second century AD, and we have a man named, and I may butcher this pronunciation, Tsai Wun in China is credited with inventing paper. So prior to that, there was papyrus and some other things, but, um, and there might, might have been paper before this, but this is what this record, um, this can, these particular students of history attribute um, publishing significance. The next significant date that this chart pulls out and is uh, 808 AD, where the Diamond Sutra was printed in China with wood blocks, and it's now the world's oldest known printed book. In 1456, we jump a whole bunch of years, we have the Gutenberg Press. So, at, interestingly, religion and the Bible specifically, uh, thank you, brother um, uh, Leon, for subscri uh, subscribing. I'm glad that um, we're approaching that 50 mark um, quickly. So, in 1456, we have the Gutenberg Press, and we have the Gutenberg Bible. We have, we start to notice this correlation between modern publishing methods advancing and the Bible being at the forefront of that movement. Notice what happens in the, in 1456. You have the printing press, like no sooner is the printing press invented than is it made so that the Bible was printed. Notice what happens. We're going to get to 1844, which they skip on this chart, but I'm going to include. But once we get to 1844, we'll see something else interesting happen. 1476, English diplomat and writer William Caxton became known as the first Englishman to work as a printer and introduced the printing press to England. 1605, the world's first newspaper called Relation, makes its debut in Germany. 1731, the first world's first general interest magazine. The Gentleman's Magazine was first published in London. 1796, Alois Sinefelder invented the process of lithography, which allows the printing of high quality images. They skip over 1844, but in 1844, we know there's some very significant year. These charts are very are um, published, these charts were published, um, if you're still viewing, Brandon, maybe you can tell me when the 1843 chart was started to be published, if you know. Um, but a few years before 1843, we, we see these charts come to prominence. Not, so, not much longer after lithography was invented and in the process of printing high quality images, do we see a massively important prophecy get fulfilled? That prophecy is in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2. So uh, I pray God be with us as we open our Bibles. You're welcome to fall, follow along with me. This prophecy was a modern publishing prophecy. And it starts, it's words from the prophet Habakkuk. And it's in chapter 2, I think it starts might start verse 1, but the famous part is verse 2. Habakkuk's one of those books where, like, even people who read their Bible a lot are, like, not quite sure where it is. Um, I've noticed that um, sometimes you just have to have, like, the willingness to, to read the uh, index. So let's see. Habakkuk is right after... You know, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So Habakkuk here, Matthew 5. So this story is really, this, this uh, prophecy is, or this uh, is very interesting. Um, obviously, to study this thoroughly, you'd want to read the whole chapter, study, study some things, but notice what is written here. I will stand on my watch 
and I will set me and set me upon the the tower, and will will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me, and said, So these are the words of the Lord pertaining to modern publishing. What does he say to do? He says to write. Publishing. To write. What does he say to write? Write the vision and make it plain upon not one table or tablet, but plain upon tables, the King James says. A more understandable translation might say, plain upon tablets, that he may run that does what? D readeth it. So it's a vision made plain upon tables, and these are facsimile reproductions from a gentleman um, he goes by William Miller on Facebook. Um, he uh, did the hard work of diligently replicating, you know, nearly perfectly the um, the original 1843 and what we call the 1850 chart. Um, 1843 um, existed a few years before 1843, but it did not than it is called the 1843 because it has the number 1843 on on a prominent in a, it's anyway uh, those are the names 1843 chart 1850 chart so what does it say write the vision this is the Lord write the vision and make it plain upon tablets or tables that he may run that readeth it for the vision is yet for an appointed time but at the end it shall speak and not lie Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Romans one seventeen, Paul is actually quoting, You, uh, we can conclude, I think, reasonably, that Paul is quoting this very verse. He's saying the just shall live by faith. What faith? Well, the faith of Jesus, the faith of Yeshua, Mashiach, Jesus Christ. So, what faith does Jesus have? Does we know that, uh, that these visions came from somewhere, and uh, these are visions that are we see a chronological chart of the visions of Daniel and John, published by J. V. Himes. It says. 14 Devonshire Street, and it's interestingly what it says here. It says, Thayer and Co. Litho Lithography, Boston. So before this could be made plain upon tables, uh, before this could be made plain upon tables, it would seem reasonable to expect that the printing press would need to be invented and the lithography technology or however you say it would also need to be invented so clearly this vision as it is written it says for the vision is yet for an appointed time interesting i believe the time that it's talking about is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong if someone knows this history better than me, I believe the time that it's talking about is 1798. Let's look, look, look at this. Lithography was invented in 1796. The Bible talks about in prophecy that the time of the end would begin in 1798. And I'm just looking at this correlation now, so this is like, we're looking at it together, we're learning things. The very invention that would, in, would, would enable a message to go wide across the world with, I think they printed a hundred charts the first time. They printed a hundred or so of these charts, and the message went around the world. And that's in large part because of a certain prophecy 
related to the Ottoman Empire. Where is it? Here it is. The sixth trumpet commenced at the end of the first woe. It continued for an hour and a day, a month and a year, 309 and 300 months and a year. Okay, so here we have a prophecy. Um, Revelation 18, and I, beheard, and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the three angels, which are yet to sound. The first woe commenced July, 7th, July 27th, 1299, when Achman, the founder of the Turkish Empire, made his first attack upon the Greeks. Notice how this angel's, uh, anyway, this angel's pointing in the Greek area. The founder of the Turkish Empire, okay, their power was to hurt men five months. That's from Revelation, and Revelation 9, one says, the fifth angel sounded, the first world commenced in 1299, but notice that the sixth trumpet was to, it continued an hour a day, a month, and a year. And when you look at the Bible, there's this principle of a day for a year, um, it's, I don't have the verses memorized, but we'll, we'll be Bereans and we'll pull it up for you. I might actually use it down here. So we have the year day principle. This is, um, I found this on 1844madesimple.org. I've never used this website before, but it seems to be uh, good enough to, uh, to answer this question. In Numbers 1434, the days used to measure off years are derived from events of the immediate historical past. Um, so let's just take a look at the Bible verses. I'm not so concerned with what this website has to say as much as I am concerned with what the Bible has to say. And I pray that we can all have that attitude, that we can prioritize our sources. So we're going to Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. And this is all laying the foundation for why these publications matter. Um, okay, Ezekiel chapter 4. In Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, we have, And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. And it would take a long time to give you the context, but these are instructions that uh, the Most High, the Father, gave to Ezekiel in order to paint a prophetic picture and send a message. So, like, this is very deliberate, very intentional. God is telling a prophet to do a certain thing for a certain reason so that the people of his day and the people of future time can comprehend some lesson. And one of those lessons is what he says here. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So clearly there is evidence in the Bible for this day for a year principle. So the other reference it gives is Numbers 1434, let's see what that has to say. Numbers 1434. And the numbers of and the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities. Even forty years ye shall know my breach of promise. So there is this principle in the Bible, right from the Torah actually. So, 
of two or three witnesses. It is repeated in 2 Corinthians 13 for those of you who are um, who put the New Testament above the Old Testament. But this So even Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, said, But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. Deuteronomy 19.15 A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed, or the, on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a matter be confirmed. This is the third time I am coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. 2 Corinthians 13, 1. 1 Timothy 5, 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Hebrews 10, 10, 28. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And here's the original source, Deuteronomy 17, 6. Or one of the early sources. On the evidence of two or th two witnesses or three witnesses, he is he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. How wise is this counsel? Notice what is clearly said. You cannot have someone just come out and say, he hurt me, he attacked me, she hurt me, she attacked me, she did this, she did that, he did this, he did that. You need more than one person saying something happened in order for there to be a legal action, in order for there to be some kind of conclusion drawn as to what actually happened. The Bible basically says you cannot do this whole he, should, he said, she said contest. Like, you need a multiple... Or a he said, he said. Like, you can't have just, like, two people saying, accusing each other. You need a he said, he said, he said, in contrast to what the other person is saying. You need two or three witnesses, So yeah, basically. So it's important I bring this up because I'm not just pulling out nothing, something from nowhere. The Bible clearly, and I think you can see for yourself if you look up those two verses. And again, those verses are... Um, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. So I emphasize that so much because what happened historically is that when they were publishing these things, they actively published that based on this day, to year, day for year principle, that on August 11th, 1840, exactly a day, a month, and a year, an hour, a day, a month, and a, a prophetic hour, a prophetic day, a prophetic month, and a prophetic year, which calculates... From 391 years and 15 days from when the from from the starting point, they calculated that the Ottoman Empire would fall. And they and it was August 11th, 1840 that they calculated this would happen. This is one of the most critical points in all of history because this is when the day for a year principle was vindicated on the world stage. The world could finally look and see for themselves that this day for a year interpretation was valid. And they proceeded to make claims that uh, there would be something significant happening, happening in, in the autumn of 1844, and that's another subject. But the point is that this era of printing press and lithography was the modern publishing of the day. And they had news for the planet. They had new news for the world. And that message was communicated by the means of modern publishing. Lithography, printing press, preaching, public preaching, and they completely reinvigorated this concept of tent meetings. Prior to the great Second Advent movement, which is what this movement was called in the 
30s into 40s, prior to this great Second Advent movement that was looking to the coming of Christ and declaring, calling people to repentance, prior to this movement, the reputation of gathering at a tent is for circuses and theater stuff and like just vanity. Like it was basically vanity fair stuff. And that's an expression from the Pilgrim's Progress, meaning like a fair that people gathered to do vain things. Like they sold stuff, they partied, they had carnivals, festivals, circuses. Like that's what people use tents for. It was revolutionary to set up a tent and preach. And that's what they started to do. And I believe that as it is written, uh, this Millerite history, because this was largely in, largely led by a man named William Miller, who it so happens that the guy who on Facebook's name is William Miller, he took, he like, he operates under that name as, I don't know why he does it, but he chooses to. But anyway, this man, the original William Miller from the 1800s, he was convinced that Christ was coming and he used modern publishing methods because what do we see here? Published by J.B. Himes. J.B. Himes was a modern publisher of his era. He was preaching the word by using publishing methods. He was getting sure, getting William Miller to these tent meetings. He was getting these charts printed. He was getting the message out by making it plain upon tables. So, um, let's continue. This We just took a brief detour. But what I wanted to explain is that also, interestingly, in 1844, the first telegram was sent. And what did it say? Let us find out. The first telegram. And you can verify all of this yourself. On May 24th, 1844, Samuel F.B. Morse, that's where we get Morse code from, dispatched the first telegraphic message over an experimental line from Washington, D.C., an interesting place to have that happen, to Baltimore. The message taken from where? The Bible. And that very Bible verse is very interesting because right in this year, you could ask this very question. And this is what people were asking, because there was a great disappointment that occurred when Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, did not come. And people were wondering, what is God doing? What's wrong here? Like, what happened? And they soon later discovered that the very event that was to occur, because they were mathematically correct that the autumn of 1844... October 22nd specifically, would be something happening. They believed that the, the, the Bible says the sanctuary would be cleansed. They believed the sanctuary was the earth. Many of them all across the planet believed the sanctuary was the earth and that the sanctuary would be cleansed by fire at the second coming, the advent of Christ. However, that did not happen, but indeed the sanctuary this prophecy is still true in that the sanctuary was cleansed it just wasn't cleansed in the way that they understood so or it's the cleansing had commenced so here's a little picture of the sanctuary you can't see very well um but the sanctuary is the ancient replica so to speak of the heavenly sanctuary in ancient, in the 1800s, they went back to their Bibles, their massive worldwide movement shrunk down to a small little select group. But that small little select group proceeded to search the scriptures to see if these things were so. And they discovered that nowhere in the Bible is this earth described as the sanctuary. That common, that was a common misconception of the era. However, what do you find? The Bible in Hebrews talks of a heavenly sanctuary. And that sanctuary has the same elements of compartments. There was the outer court, the holy place as it's called, and then the holy of holies or the most holy place. And the holy place and the most holy place had a veil. And it was in the most holy place or the holy of holies 
that the Ark of the Covenant was found, that the high priest would do the things he did in that spot. And it was on the special time of year during the feast or the Moedim or the Moed. Uh, it's just the word for appointed time in Hebrew is Moed is singular, Moedim is plural. During this Moedim, one of these Moedim, this Moed, this appointed time, this feast of the Day of Atonement, there were special things that happened, and we can get into it some other day, but they recognized that this was all a big picture of what Christ has done and will do. This sanctuary, we're, we'll, we'll pull it up. Um, the Bible tells us, Thy way, O God... is in the sanctuary. And that's Psalm 77, 13. So, some really incredible things were discovered, and this was the modern publishing of their era. This was 1843, this went around the world. 1850, they had some understanding about different things. You notice this says 1843, that was a, there was a mathematical calculation where they're like on a in math, there is a zero um, on a timeline or on a line, but where you, where there's an, on a number line. But in the year system, there's no zero year. It goes from year one BC to year one AD, and that's just how it was. And because of that mathematical confusion, they had some um, they had some confusion to regard to 1843 and 1844. There's lots of things we could dig into. Um, I think maybe one of the next times we'll do a, we can do a study on the charts themselves and like more details about where they came from. And um, But I'll, I'll just read this quote here. And this is a quote, uh, from a book called The Great Controversy. As early as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision and to make it plain upon tables, it's talking about the prophecy we just read, that he may run that readeth it, had suggested to Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and the Revelation. The publication of this chart was regarded as a fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. In a, uh, there's a book called there's a collection of manuscript releases, and in the fifth one and in the fifteenth one, we have quotes like this. God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart. I saw it was needed that the truth be made plain upon tables. And I saw it was needed, and that the truth made plain upon tables would affect much and would cause souls to come to a knowledge of the truth. So publishing would call this publication of these charts would cause souls to come to a knowledge of the truth. Hey brother, I was talking about you. This is William Miller, this guy on Facebook commenting. Um, thank you brother for your hard work. It's, uh, it's um, you know, do not grow weary in well doing. There's many souls that I think will be reaped because of your hard labors. Um, so, I lost my place here. Um, all right. Here we go. On our return to Brother Nichols, the, the gentleman who published this one, published by O. Nichols, the Lord gave me a vision and showed me that the truth must be plain, made plain upon tables, and it would cause many to decide for the truth of the third angel's message, which is the truth for the last days. Again, we'll have to go into another video or podcast to do that. With the two former being made plain upon tables. So this chart here, this author is saying that the first and second angel's messages are made plain upon this table, and that the third angel's message is made plain upon this one. And again, to get into what that means, it's, uh, it's, it would take some time, but basically 
the things we need to know for these last days are contained on these charts. And the fact that we don't know about them, the fact that we're not like have we don't have this memorized, the fact that we have not beheld these and become changed, the fact that we have not looked into these prophecies and found out that the truth is the truth, that God is real, that God told us that he declares the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the thing that the things that are not yet come, he is coming. He told us this rock here represents Christ and is going to crush the feet. This represents the kingdoms of the world, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome, and these ten kingdoms here. These, this stone will crush the ten kingdoms and become a mountain that will fill the whole earth, meaning that Christ is coming and he will conquer and we can believe it because he told us that all of this would happen all of this would happen all of this would happen way beforehand we don't need to have any reason to doubt we should be out there sounding the cry blowing the trumpet from the from the towers we ought to be letting the world know that God is real, that his son is coming back, and that they can live forever in his kingdom. So, we have a message to publish, and my question for you today is, what are you going to do about it? Because you can't know... Like, if you know a car is going to hit someone, and you don't... Um, and you don't say anything, you don't say, get out of the road, come... You're like, you need to do something. Like, there's a famous video from from a, an atheist. His name's Hen Pendulette. He's from the famous Penn and Teller duo of magicians. And he's a staunch atheist and even in this video where he's talking about a christian who and he's like tearful he is saying i know there's not a god he says that however in the same video where he says i know there's not a god he cries he he's tearful in regard to someone who was so earnest in uh, reaching his soul with the life-saving truth. He came up to him after his magician show, and he's just, and Penn, like, he's very critical of Christians. So he, Penn Jillette is, and I, from, from what I can tell, and he was very, he made a very good, he made a point of saying that this particular Christian, he could tell he was, like, intelligent, and, like, you know, you know, like, he didn't seem like the kind of Christian that he'd make fun of. He seemed like an intelligent, sophisticated, honest man, sincere and loving. And this man, he handed Penn a, a little Bible, a New Testament with Psalms or whatever it was, and it had little handwritten notes in it with his phone number, with his contact information, and he gave him the gospel message, it seems like, and he told him that he cares about him, he knows he's an atheist, and Penn was moved. This man went out of his way to give the message of life to the one of the most publicly staunch atheistic people that ever lived. And he, that man who received that Bible, that pendulette, he, he cried. And he said, Christians who believe in eternal hell or even just a possibility of eternal life and they don't tell anyone, they don't proselytize, as the technical term is, those people are evil. He said something to that effect, and it's like, do you want your family and friends to not know that they have opportunities for eternity? That, because we need to do something. It is written... Let me find it. Matthew 
Matthew 24, 14. Notice what it says. <clears throat> There's a song. I'll sing it for you. It's, I'll, re, I'll read the verse first, and then I'll sing the song. And the gospel, and this gospel, this good news, of the kingdom shall be preached in all the nation, and then the end shall come. The song goes like this. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And then it proceeds to go into Revelation, where it um, goes into the three angels' messages, which are described as the everlasting gospel. Yeah, Revelation 14, verse 6, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. Notice what the Bible says. About publishing and its relation to the end times. I really like Ooh. So you notice in Psalm 26 that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Deuteronomy 13, 32, 3. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Mark 5, 20. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. They marveled at what he had published about the great things that Jesus had done. Jeremiah 4, verse 5, Declare ye in Judah, and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in, in the land. Cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go into the defense city. Jeremiah 31, 7, For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Mark 1.45, but he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter. I like that language. Like, we need to blaze abroad. We need to set this world on fire with the good news of the second coming. And because we don't know... Because people don't know is why he's not coming. Because what does it say? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. That's a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Oh. All right, let's finish our let's finish our um, history of publishing. Let's finish this up. 1892, we had a we had a big detour in 1844. A lot happened. Uh, I want to recognize these comments. William Miller says the message that the judgment would come in 1843 in 1844 is the first angel's message, and the first angel's message was for the Millerite, where the third 
was for us at the very end. So then, do you have some comments on the second angel's message? That would be, if he's still there, I don't know if he's still there. So the second angel's message Babylon has fallen, has fallen, okay. Yeah. So that's on the, um, it's on here. I would think. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we took a big detour 1844 in the history of publishing because a lot of important publishing happened in 1844. Um, notice how the first, like, no sooner, or like, you see printing press, Bible printed. You see telegram, first telegram ever sent. I don't know if I even got to that verse. Um, first telegram ever sent was Numbers, 20, was Numbers 23, number 23. So let's read that. So after listening to all this stuff that happened in 1844, notice what the first telegram ever sent on May 24th, 1844 was. Numbers 23... <laughs> 23. The message that he wrote in that telegram was, What hath God wrought? And it's a good question, and that's what people needed to discover for themselves, is what did God do in 1844? And why does it matter? Does it matter at all? Does it matter today? What's the deal? So... All right, we're bringing to a close here. Um, so to conclude our history of publishing, we have 1892, the four color rotary press was invented, 1925, magazines became popular, Esquire, Rolling Stone, and Newsweek became household names. In 1932, the Times New Roman font, look at that, was debuted by the Times newspaper and was released commercially the following year, 1938, the first xerography printer was developed by Chester Carlson and was patented in 1942. 1996, traditional newspapers began to develop online versions. Interesting, modern publishing as we know it today is beginning to take shape as early as 1996. 2007, the first Amazon Kindle was released and sold out in less than six hours. So... I think a good addition to this is let's see when the first YouTube video was published. So the first YouTube video was published on April 23rd, 2005. Five. It's only been a little while since April 23rd, 2005, but a whole lot of YouTube videos have been made. And notice how much opportunity we have to preach the gospel. We can go out there, we can tell the world that God is real, that he is coming, and that is what the Assembly of Modern Publishers is about. We hope to assemble together with all those who are preaching the truth. And if you want to be among them, please contact me. We hope to have a group going where we can encourage each other. We can bless each other. We can teach each other. We can guide each other. We can promote each other's content. We can curate content and put it on a central hub my friend and I are working on a new website called modernpublishers.org where we hope to have a massive archive of videos available for to be streamed, to download, books to purchase, PDFs to download, free resources, and free audiobooks. Uh, and I just really am thankful for the privilege of living in an era where we can utilize and leverage technology to publish the gospel. And that, again, is not to diminish the preceding technologies, such as the printing press, such as the printer, such as uh, physical literature and the distribution of physical literature in Cole Porter evangelism, door-to-door -door work, 
on the street ministry, preaching at church, preaching in public. All of those things are modern publishing. All of those things are things we hope to do. So thank you for everyone who's watched. I appreciate you. I really thank you. And sharing these videos, liking these videos, all this internet stuff, all that stuff really helps our mission grow. And I just thank you for being part of this um, first podcast. And I hope to publish many more. And I thank you for all that you've done. Um, please don't hesitate to comment in the archived video. I hope to answer questions, share different things. And remember, the Bible is the armory where you may equip for the struggle. Remember that we can assemble together and we can publish together. So shalom, my friends, and God be with you till we meet again.